Welcome to the Cool Tools Show. I'm Mark Frauenfelder, Editor-in-Chief of Cool Tools, a website of tool recommendations written by our readers. You can find us at cool-tools.org. I'm joined by my co-host, Kevin Kelly, founder of Cool Tools. Hey, Kevin. Hey, it's great to be here. In each episode of the Cool Tools Show, Kevin and I talk to a guest about some of his or her favorite uncommon and uncommonly good tools they think others should know about. Our guest this week is Todd Lappin. Todd is a writer, photographer, occasional journalist, and full-time geek with a particular interest in transportation, infrastructure, and Chinese and Japanese culture. Hey, Todd, how are you? Hi, guys. Glad to be here. Well, it's really wonderful to hear your voice, Todd. Todd, along with Mark, were colleagues of mine at Wired, and um, it's a reunion of sorts right now. It is. Those were good times. Those were good times. They really were, yeah. And uh, it just seems like yesterday that I heard your voice, and here we are again. So, um, Todd, tell us about uh, some of your tools. Let's start with your your Miata. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just I sort of feel like this is a weird one for cool tools, but I I have many times thought, God, what a what a perfect tool this is, which is, you know, a first generation, which would be 1989 to 1997. Mazda Miata is just kind of like a perfect car. Um, there's a joke in the car world that um, that Miata is the answer to every car question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Why? Why? Well, um, I mean, like if you were to buy, uh, what's the best car to buy a teenage child or something Miata, like that? Yeah. Miata. Okay. In fact, I, in fact, I'm in a group where with a group bunch of dads who have bought Miatas for their kids. I'm the only dad who owns one, but, uh, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's exactly that. It's like, I need a car. I want to, I have a, and then the answer is almost always Miata. Todd, do you remember when, when I, when I was, when we were all working at Wired together, that's what Carla and I had was like a 89 Miata. Perfect. Silver one. Um, yeah. We loved that. Yeah. They're lovely and they're cheap and they, um, are very reliable and they are surprisingly practical um, in almost every way, um, far more so than you would think given their size and just sort of in a kind of dollar to fun to practical way. Um, I'm just finding it's like, it's just such a lovely tool that solves a million problems that I didn't really know I needed solved until I had one. And I was like, Oh, this, this is just means like so many other cars that I've been using are just so much more than I needed. And I didn't really realize that. Give me an example of a problem that it solves that you didn't know you had. Well, Obviously, you know, parking is lovely. I mean, basically, it really opens up. Uh, I live in a city, so it opens up the city in a way that's really hard to imagine until you have had a really, really small car. It's kind of like riding a bike. You just you don't really worry anymore about will I be able to find a parking space? You know, you can always find something because you just you fit in all these other places that most things don't. But the funny part is that, you know, Costco, you know, the Costco run, it's no problem if you basically you know, the trunk is a little bigger than you think. But the real thing is that if you're driving by yourself, you've got the passenger seat. And if you put the roof down, it basically acts like a small pickup truck. And, <laughs> and so, you know, the passenger seat becomes like a, a single, you know, a little thing where you can carry a palm tree if you wanted to, <laughs> which none of my other cars uh -huh. can do. So, uh, so it just, you know, pretty consistently impressed with how how actually practical it is for actually carrying stuff as long as you're not trying to carry a whole lot of people. I can't do a sheet of plywood though, or can it? Uh, not a sheet of plywood, but if you wanted to carry a whole lot of, a lot of um, plywood is obviously the, the benchmark test for a lot of things, but, but I would say, you know, two by four is no problem. Again, you just, you just mm -hmm. stick, you know, you go to pickup mode again, you could probably carry 15, 20, two by four is sticking out the passenger foot. Well, um, and flying up into the air, and that would be just fine. And I, I've never done that, but I would not hesitate to do that at all. Um, how much? And that, do you, how much do you pay for one? That's the thing about them is that they're incredibly cheap, um, or they can be. Uh, uh, you can get them for less than five thousand dollars, and then and they'll be fine. It won't look great, but mm -hmm. it'll be great. They're there, uh, the, the other way I've compared them, again, apart from the Miata is the answer to every question, is they're kind of like the way people used to, I'm a little a little, a little little um, young for this, but kind of like the way people used to think about Volkswagen Beetles, basically a Miata does that, mm -hmm. except it's actually fun. <laughs> like it's not, it's, it's a legitimate sports it's, car. It's, it's a Beetle that is fun versus ugly. Right. It's a Beetle that's fun versus ugly and that isn't slow, that isn't, 
you know, doesn't overheat. It has all the sort of charms that people used to attribute to Beatles, except you basically are getting a modern car. And I said this earlier, but you know, they're from this little golden age as I'm sort of a car geek and I'm starting to realize that the early nineties, uh, were sort of this perfect period of car technology because you started to have just enough electronics, uh, that you had basically, uh, you know, electronic fuel injection and you had an engine management computer and that's about it. So what that means is you basically solved all the finicky parts of older cars, you know, so you don't, you don't have a carburetor anymore. You now have fuel injection. You don't have to worry about all these ratios because the, engine management computer does all that, but you don't have the kind of complexity that you associate with modern cars. So you get all the reliability of a modern car, but you don't really have any of the inaccessibility of a more contemporary car. Wow. You just sold me there. Yeah, yeah. that's cool. That's cool. Does it have a water cooled engine or is it air like a bug? It's a water cooled engine. So it's, again, it's a, it's a modern engine. And of course, you know, the mm -hmm. other thing about Miata's and uh, any Japanese car, and again, this is a rabbit hole that we probably shouldn't even start down, but any Japanese car from the late eighties, early nineties, that's sort of Japan, Japan's bubble era. Um, the technology they were using at that point and were baking into everything, including the Miata was the kind of stuff that basically was, you know, a decade ahead of its time. So they've aged incredibly right. well. I, my first two cars were Toyota Tercels, the <laughs> stick shift version. They were basically like indestructible. Um, would, would, would there, would the engines be similar to the, what was in the Miata, but just different in a different chassis? It would probably depend. They're going to be different because it's, it's a different manufacturer, but, um, but again, it's really, I would think to be, you know, obviously I'm speaking of the Miata here, but almost any car from that period, as long as you're talking about something essentially from the fuel injection era, um, you're going to get a lot of these advantages, uh, especially from Japan. Um, but the Miata brings them together in this way that's really charming. And then the other things that are really great about them is because they were so popular, there's a lot of them. And there's also like, Parts are very simple. There's an entire, you know, community around them. You can get whatever you want. Uh, I joke about this, but whenever it has needed a part, the part usually costs forty five dollars. No matter what it is, it seems to cost forty five dollars. Uh, and you're like, that's that's fine. I'm happy to pay that. Mm -hmm. um, and they're easy to work on if you want to too. You can either give it to your mechanic; he knows what to do, or you can fix it yourself, and that's not that hard right. either. Wow. Okay, that's that's a great stretch, and I love that idea of it of it being this the answer for everything car, re car related. Really yeah, yeah. Google yeah. that, and you'll see there's like an entire yeah. genre of articles about you know the Miata is the answer to every car question. So. And there must be like I don't know gazillion YouTube videos on how to fix them and stuff. Yes, absolutely. I mean, we this I'm sure you guys have touched on this, but like it's hard to imagine that we used to try and do anything without YouTube videos. I know, describing I know. How to do it. Don't get me, don't get me started. I just exactly. think totally, <laughs> totally underappreciated how yeah. vast, how Life profound, changer. how profound, <laughs> how incredibly immense the acceleration due to YouTube. And I say that because I am watching it every night, you know, and, it's just, it's just my thing. So yeah, yeah same um, here. I mean, last night I was learning how to keep teach, learning how to cook Thai street food by watching a Thai street food guy make his food. And you're, you're I'm like, this is amazing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> was, yeah. was it, was it, was it Mark, Mark, uh, Wyland's, uh, it, you know, that guy? It, I don't know him and it wasn't him. It was literally just some dude in Thailand oh. who runs a street stall. Somebody took a video of him, but it was amazing to watch. I learned a lot. There's a guy who has 5 million followers. He lives in Thailand and he does uh, street food around the world, not just in Thai, but real, real street food, like in Pakistan or in um, Ethiopia, um, all the places you really want to know. Anyway, um, I'm, I'm a fan of his, but we're back into the tool. So, Talking about food, um, you you have a tool for us in the kitchen. Yes, uh, you and I have have gone back and forth on this, one, but I want to plug it again because it's become, again, dur especially during uh, we're you know it's it's uh, December twenty twenty. We're still in COVID. We're in fact we're moving closer to a lockdown state again, uh, and and it turns out like one of the most essential tools that my family has has been our food storage system. You know, basically, you know the kind of plastic containers that we use to store food in our fridge has just become such a daily essential um, in terms of our ability to, um, you know, keep food, um, simplify our lives by not having to cook every single day. And, uh, and, you know, I, I just, I've found like this, this lock and lock system 
uh, food storage system, which I believe is a Korean uh, company, um, is just wonderful because um, it has rubber gaskets. It has uh, these tabs that lock th- from the top that lock onto the base. So it's very, very secure seal. Um, and the, the really cool feature, which again, I, I think as a practical matter is difficult to overstate is um, I'm able to get um, a lot of different size containers that all use the same size lid. So I don't end up in a situation where I'm juggling, you know, trying to manage which top goes with which bottom. I can have a lot of different, different uh, containers that have different capacities and yet Oh, I really only have one lid and I have a lot of that one lid. Right. So, that's, that's brilliant. Utterly brilliant. It's been really, really handy. And like I said, I can stick them in the freezer. I can stick them in the fridge. And it just means that we've been able to eat really, really well um, while only cooking once in a while. Yeah. It's really great. Yeah. We're still, I'm still with a glass, uh, you know, the snap lid kind of a thing, yep. but um, I haven't made that leap to, to the, to the single size lid thing, which would be humongous. I'd be interested if they had like a, glass version of the single size lid that would be really cool i'm sure there is a glass equivalent of something like this to be sure right, right. um that's great and you've heard lock, my theory. And, lock and lock is the is the brand or the variety is that right is yeah that it's a brand it? that i started okay. noticing uh again around I, I think i picked up my first set of it at some asian markets here in the bay area um and I think I was telling you about this earlier, Kevin. I have this like completely unfounded hypothesis that, you know, we were just talking a minute ago about Japan engine technology in the early 90s. I, I'm a strong believer, and this is an unfounded hypothesis, that Korean food storage technology um, may have a advantage because of their, uh, the, the, basically, they uh, eat and store a lot of uh, very smelly fermented <laughs> From Kim, kimchi. Li- liquidy uh-huh. kimchi stuff that if it leaks, it's disastrous. Oh, and they also like to bring their lunch to work. Work, right. <laughs> so so that, that yeah. this combination has basically created an incentive for them to have really, really good seals and gaskets on their food storage system and to, for them to be very fail safe so it doesn't open by accident. So that, that's my completely unfounded hypothesis about why, uh, why Lock and Lock being from Korea gives it a special advantage. But, uh, but having now been using this stuff for more than five years, I, I can say that it's it's fantastic. That looks great. It, it's it's a great system. The, the the single the single lid size is the genius part because that is something yeah. that we contend with all the time, which is where is that right. size circular mm-hmm. thing? I can't find it. Um, I have all the other. I have lids. I don't have you know bottoms to, and so right that's then they the, get separated. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, so that's worked out really, really well. And, um, and they have some that are very small again, like, you know, very thin. If you're looking at the picture of it, you can see that they basically the difference is how tall is the base. Some are actually pretty tall and can hold a liter and some of them are very small and hold like a, you know, basically they're not much bigger than an iPhone. And right. So, I think if I was designing this from scratch, I might go and dare to have two size slits. I think I could live with that. They do have different sizes. Like I said, I'm just neurotically only buying one of them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> yeah. To be clear, it's pretty flexible. If that's your thing, I'm just, I don't, I don't want that kind of, I can't deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Todd, what's another, um, what's your third pick for us um, here? I'm going to go, I'm, so this is a, I'm going to do one more food one and then I'm going to do okay. another one, but since we're on the food thing, I, this is a relatively recent one, which is just the discovery of essentially a, a hamburger style flipping spatula as the, basically the one stovetop st- tool to replace them all. Um, except for tongs. Except for tongs. Well, I, yeah, or, or long chopsticks. Right. But, but it basically, this has uh, replaced, um, you know, an entire, ca- an entire, uh, caddy full of like spat wooden spatulas and all this other stuff in my house. Um, it's similar uh, to a Asian shovel, shovel, and, and it works just like one, although again, uh, it's got a flat, uh, edge instead of a slightly rounded edge, but, uh, um, you could, you could fix that, right? Yeah. On, you could. on well, your I, grinder. Uh, or having both, I I keep both, but I've you know I've used it, and it, I will say like it's just replaced so many tools because it does everything, and and they're stiff enough, kind of like a walk shovel, but they're even a little bit sharper, so it even cuts reasonably well um, when you're you know sort of trying to dice your meat or something in um, in a in a pan. Um, 
they scrape, they do, they do everything uh, really, really well. And like I said, in terms of the really simplifying uh, my kitchen organization, especially now when I'm cooking so much, uh, it's really, really been terrific. And, you know, you can get them anywhere. I got mine at a, uh, I bought it on a Lark um, at a kitchen supply store and then happened to notice some, uh, actually I watched, in K- Kevin, here we go again, an excellent YouTube video on how to make Japanese style fried rice. And it was kind of like, some dude in Tokyo doing kind of Benihana kind of tongue moves with his uh, thing. But the point was, I was like, Oh, look at how he's using that. That's fantastic. And it turns out, yeah, it is. It totally works. So it's, it's been great. I think the, the, the Asian versions are sharpened on the side. So it actually works like a kind of a cleaver too. Yeah, a little bit. And like I said, some of the American ones do too. And, and that actually is great. You actually use that while you're cooking. So like I said, it's, and you, the only thing I've, I said uh, when I was writing this down, is you, you definitely don't want to get one that's really flexible. You want it to be really stiff. Um, you don't want one that bends too much because you want to be able to really apply some force, whether you're scraping or cutting or whatever, without it without it flexing. So just a little bit of stiffness. I, I, my, I like ones that are six to eight inches long because they're not too big, so they don't take over your kitchen. And uh, yeah, it's been fantastic. I gave one to a friend recently who said you know exactly what I said, which was, how did I... She's a professional cook. She's like, how did I not have one of these in my house all the time. This is fantastic. So, uh, Right. And the one you pointed us to is, is all of $20. Yeah. And that's expensive. You know, I, I couldn't, you know, I was trying to find one on Amazon that was just like mine and that was the closest, but I think I got mine for $12 or something. It's totally, totally. You could probably, yeah. uh, Go to a restaurant supply store or somewhere like that. Yep. A restaurant supply or smart and final or one of those kind of places. They're not that hard to find once you decide you want to look for it. Yeah. Well, great. Okay. And so um, tell us about your fourth non-food pick. Yeah, the fourth non-food pick is is kind of a funny one that I, I, I'm actually maybe a little bit late to this, but but it has also changed my life in lovely ways, which is just the exciting world of Bluetooth portable speakers, um, which, I you know, I, again, there's lots of them and, and they've been around for a while, but but it's pretty cool if you haven't checked them out, partially because, you know, a couple things have happened. One is Bluetooth has gotten really good, very simple. It just kind of works now, which is great. It wasn't always true, but you know, in the last couple of years, it just got really reliable. And then, um, and also, we've also uh, not we we, but not me specifically, but our species have apparently gotten quite good <laughs> at at uh, at making devices that have very small form factors but create very big and and full bodied sound. Um, yeah, that's true, and and that's pretty cool. So. These little speakers are fantastic. I now own four of them, um, and I sprinkle them around my house. Um, but there's a couple that are even, you know, what I love about them is it's sort of become commodity enough that that you start to have really weird little specialized versions of them, and those are, you know, sort of extra wonderful. So one of the ones that I wanted to to uh, say I've really appreciated is I, I originally – got an ultimate ears wonder an ultimate ears uh ue2 i think is which is sort of a it looks kind of like a um uh like a a a to-go coffee cup it's kind of tall um and that's really good and actually i this is where i really discovered this i was traveling with a friend who had one of those in his suitcase and he just kept having music wherever we went and it was lovely um but the wonder boom that i'm i'm recommending here is is sort of a smaller version of that it's about the size of a softball um, and it basically, I have one that I just leave in my suitcase all the time. It's just always there. Um, and I use it wherever I go, whenever I go anywhere, it's been terrific. And it, it, it makes a, this little thing, uh, that's again, the size of a softball. Um, I just used it last weekend, in fact, in a room, you know, kind of a big, kind of a great room situation while I was cooking with some friends and it filled the whole room and everyone thought it sounded great. And they kept saying, where is that coming from? Cause the house had a, had a had a stereo system and it they were amazed when they saw it's this tiny little thing sitting on the counter is making this gigantic noise um and it sounds terrific um and it's so small like i said that that you know i just it can fit in there all the time so that's so so it's running off of your phone basically yep your phone is is everything your music collection everything you need and uh and it and that's all and you're, you're good to go um, so I have one, I basically, I have one on each level of my house. So I keep one in upstairs. I keep one in the kitchen and I have one that lives in my garage. Um, and that's pretty much, you know, my Sonos system <laughs> and, right, right, right. and except it's, it, I don't need a Sonos system. I just have these three things. And when you're in one of those parts of the house, you just turn it on and, and there you go. Right. I've seen the new Alexas are sort of looking at like a very similar 
form function and i'm wondering if they are kind of employing the same kind of um technology to make the sound do you have any knowledge about that i don't i have not i mean of course you know what's going to happen is late night youtube video sessions about about you know small device acoustics but um uh (laughs) that's inevitable and we'll probably you know ping me tonight at 2 a.m and that's probably where i'll be (laughs) but but but, uh but uh but i have not i mean i know that alexas are kind of about sound and kind of about you know talking to them so they have a slightly different use case um the other one that I really like that it's kind of special. What I love again these specializations. So hopefully we'll talk about this in a few minutes. But I I bought a vehicle recently that's old and it came with no radio, and I was thinking about installing a radio in it, and I realized I don't really need to. I can just buy one of these, and I found one that I was oh, like, oh, I see. There's, there's so much. There's so much. It's an old oh. truck, so it has lots of bare metal in the cab. So I was like, oh, if there was one with a great magnet on it, I wouldn't need to mount it. I just stick it on the bare metal and I'm good to go. And I found one that does exactly that. It's actually designed for golf carts. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's designed to clamp to the roof rack of, of a golf cart for a day of golfing. But um, it has fantastic magnets. This is the um, the rock form. It has great magnets in it, and so what? It's been terrific. It you know it just sits in the in the tr- in the cab of the truck when I use it. But then you know if I want to have a picnic, which I do with this truck, um, I literally just take the same thing out and just stick it to the tailgate, and now we have music while we eat. And so, what's the battery life like on on these in general? Great, surprisingly good. You know, like they, you know, they, I'm getting ten to twenty four hours out of out of a battery, which is you know fine. That's so, doable. Yeah, totally doable. So there's, you know, it's just not, there really have no major practical constraints that I've really run into. Um, and, uh, and like I said, it's one of those technologies that just feels a little bit magical, you know what I mean? Cause we are uh, speaking here, we're all old enough, you know, to like music used to be really hard, you know, <laughs> you just have to like, mm-hmm. how do you, what's, what's, where do you get the right. content? Where does the power come from? How do you, you know, it just used to be really hard and this is just so not hard and so magical. And like I said, when you just have your your stereo system and you just kind of put it in your hand and you walk from one room to the next and you're good to go, that just feels kind of lovely. Yeah, it does. So, uh, so tell us about your um, this other project you were mentioning, your new truck. Yes. Um, and it sounds like this is a um, an unusual truck. This is really, 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 really unusual, um, and it's parked in front of my house right now. It is. I bought a. Uh, a, a Japanese K fire truck, which is to say it's a, a very tiny fire truck, a tire truck, fire truck. It's a very real fire truck that looks kind of like an overgrown golf cart, but it's a truck. Do you want to explain what, uh, what K trucks are in Japan? Yeah. K trucks are this, um, uh, class of vehicles in Japan that are taxed and regulated, uh, more loosely. Um, uh, but they're st- very tightly regulated. In other words, um, they have to be a certain size. They have a very cl- strict maximum size and maximum engine size and maximum horsepower. But if you're within that size, um, they're a lot cheaper to own and operate in Japan. Um, uh, and um, they can be cars or they can be trucks. The common use of them, and actually you do see these in the United States sometimes, like college campuses will use them as like the maintenance vehicle. Um uh, you'll see them at like uh, event event facilities will often have one and instead of having one of those ATVs that Americans tend to use, they'll have uh, some of these little trucks that they use. Um, it's uh, 130 inches long total. So uh, just we'll go back to the Miata. Here's a useful benchmark. It's two feet shorter than a Miata. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so, so when, when you're in Japan and you see these, they look kind of cute. They're like, oh, wait, yeah. that's a miniature truck. And there are people driving around and it's being used. It's not like a toy. Right. It's actually, it's like they're workmen using it. And right. so it's it's a miniature version of a pickup truck or a whatever, delivery truck. Or a fire truck. <laughs> or a saying? fire truck. <laughs> so, and so that's the thing. It's pretty much like driving a puppy is what I tell people. It's, <laughs> and that's, you know, the same way people react when they see a puppy you know, it doesn't matter who they are, how old they are, what gender they are, what their background is. They just, everybody has the same reaction when you see a puppy, you just kind of lose your mind. And 
that's been my experience driving this tiny Japanese fire truck around is just people, it does not matter who they are or what they're doing. They stop and they just start laughing and smiling. And it's the most, especially during COVID, this is the fire truck has been my little COVID project, basically my COVID hobby. Um, it's just felt so appropriate to just have this thing that makes people laugh and smile uh, just in virtue yeah, of I being in the world. Um, and uh, is it street legal here? Yes, it is. So uh, I become a bit of a Jap- Japan car geek and go this. So this is where, again, the threads connect right here. Um, United States law is that we can import anything from anywhere in the world uh, as long as it's 25 years old, any car from anywhere in the world, as long as it's 25 years old. So once it's 25 years, and that's 25 years from the date of manufacture, literally, if you ha- you know, the, to the day it rolled off the assembly line. Um, uh, and if it is, none of the usual federal regulation applies. Oh, and then, wow, I it's didn't pretty know. cool. And then yeah. if you go, and then if you do the math, now what that means is we're now back in this golden age in Japan that I was just <laughs> okay. saying, where like. <laughs> These perfect cars from the early 90s, which we could never get, are now completely accessible to us. And, uh, you know, unlike this, all this regulation was passed in the 80s. And if you think about it, in 1980, they were looking at a car from like 1965 and going, you know, oh, my God, that thing's a piece of junk. Who cares? But we're not in that age anymore. Now a 25-year-old car can be basically an almost new car. Um, and and this fire truck in particular, what's amazing about it? So this is I have a 1990 Daihatsu Hijet fire truck, um, and it has 3,000 miles on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like brand new. Oh, so so where was it a fire truck? What part of Japan? Oh, this is the other fun thing. I've sort of developed a sister city relationship with the town of Kirigamane in Nagano. <laughs> Nagano, okay. It was, Nagano, yeah, it's it's very okay. It's from this little little mountain town in Nagano that probably has about 400 people in it, um, and it was it was their volunteer fire department truck, and uh, so it basically sat in the, in this garage in Nagano for 25 years, and they would occasionally drive it for a parade or to go get an oil change, and uh, um, it, the, and the, the town. I mean, all this is tr- history is really easy to trace because it's written on the door. <laughs> and why why did they, why did they sell it if it was uh... I just think because it's thirty years old, you know, anything after thirty years, you know, they're Japan, just, yeah, Japan. That is, Japan does not like old cars. In fact, I think there's a law that you, um, yeah, they get they get progressively more expensive over time right. as opposed yeah, to less expensive. Yeah. yeah, right, right. Um, so there's incentives to get rid of them, and and exporting cars is actually a pretty big industry in Japan. So Japan wants you to buy a new car in Japan, and they want to export them to other countries because that's actually an industry. Um, so, uh, so this. I have this 30-year-old, cute as a button, Japanese fire truck with 3,000 miles on it. Um, it was pretty cheap, right? Really cheap. Like, uh, let's tell us, what was it? Delivered to my door in San Francisco was $6,700. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, right? What? This, how's that possible? <laughs> exactly. Well, it was, again, If I, the cost breakdown is pretty straightforward. It was... It sold in Japan because who wants a thirty-year-old fire, tiny fire truck for fifteen hundred dollars? And the rest is basically just <laughs> the rest is just uh, oh shipping fees, brokerage fees, you know, agent fees, and all that stuff. Um, custom, a little bit of customs duty, and uh, and you know, we're out the door for sixty-seven hundred dollars, and the thing lands on my doorstep. Yeah. That wow. is so cool. Yeah, wow, it's um amazing. if anybody wants to see it, if you're listening now, it's uh on Instagram, it's teeny tiny fire truck. Uh that's it has its own account um and uh, its own personality. And um it's been I've been using it mostly just to drive around and laugh at things. Just to, like sort of I, I just love these kind of I really am into these like taking pictures of these incongruous moments that, you know, like this was never supposed to happen. You know, this this fire truck was never supposed to be here. So, you know, tiny, tiny fire truck from Nagano, Japan in front of the Golden Gate Bridge. That was never supposed to happen. You know? <laughs> right, right. Uh, things like that. Oh, um, and firefighters lose their mind as well. Well, Actual I was just going to say, yeah. <laughs> 
Um, but no, I mean, I was just working this this morning and it was parked out front and I just heard like the sound. I know the sound at this point. It was just a bunch of kids looking at it with their parents out front. And I heard the dad go, oh, no, no, don't touch it. And then, then you open the door, you go, actually, touch it as much as you want. Sit on it. It has it has like a little uh, it actually has like a little back bench seat. You know, yeah, so it has a cab it. and it has like a little seat in the back. And then I just said to these kids, you know, go ahead, sit on it. Go nuts. Um, it has a fully functional PA system which um, is incredibly loud. And I've been, I've, I've basically figured out how to run my iPhone through it and, and created a little soundboard uh, so I can create noises while I drive it. So it can drive around while making very loud R2D2 noises and, or you can push a button and it'll make a Godzilla, you know, the Godzilla uh, roar. Uh -huh. Oh, wait, here's the Godzilla. Here, here's the Godzilla noise. Ready? <laughs> Well, this is this is, is this so is awesome. this is just a great, fantastic. I don't know what you call it. Um, achievement, <laughs> uh, Todd. This is really fantastic. You can go places with this. Um, I guess I don't know what's next and across the country <laughs> road trip. Well, I mean, the, the, I did it on. I actually took it on one of the longest trips. I took it on this weekend. Somebody actually organized a friend who, uh, of course, you know all these things part of the fun is you get the thing and then you realize oh all the community that comes with the thing that i didn't know i was going to get as well and uh that's happened with this fire truck and it turns out there is a community locally of people who own these tiny cars from japan and somebody organized a group drive for us this week and um i drove it from san francisco to the top of mount hamilton to lick observatory which was you know about a 200 mile round trip and a 2500 foot elevation increase and it was fine <laughs> it's not fast but it's fine <laughs> i know another little subset that i've seen going on is people buying old cars sometimes classic cars and then electrifying them yes and um i know you think that this is the kind of the apex of automotive gasoline engine but it might also work as a electric vehicle yeah well. yeah there's actually I, one thing that's a pretty popular misconception is that car people don't really welcome this trend and actually i've seen the exact opposite that car people are so excited about this oh um, yeah yeah they're they're excited basically for t lots of teslas to die and all those parts to end up you know, available <laughs> no I'm, I'm not kidding it's just like yeah, once yeah. we actually can start to feast on the carcasses of some of these actually pretty pretty good <laughs> devices uh the possibilities are going to get really really interesting and yeah. um and so everybody's pretty excited about that all these cars that you're like ah you know i don't want to get into the engine and it's just what it's just let's just electrify it so um that's going to be that's going to that is only happening a little bit now, but I think that's going to be a big thing in a, in a couple of years again as there's a little bit more raw material to work with. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I have a friend who bought a great big kind of like Cadillac convertible cruiser thing, completely awful, but once it's electrified, it was like okay, this is really cool. Right, exactly. Like all these things become less profligate and sort of interesting. I, I think actually, if I remember correctly, Neil Young got into this like way before it was cool. Uh, he actually electrified a big Lincoln. Um, I want to say like almost 10 years ago, um, when the technology was still really not there, but, um, but the potential is, uh, the potential is there. So yes, all these things that would otherwise be like not worth fixing or irredeemable can, uh, can, can suddenly have new life and it'll be pretty right, right. cool. Well, this has been really, really great. We really appreciate, um, your tools and your picks and just, chatting with you catching up i can't wait to see this in real life um i'll come visit kevin i'll come I'll, I'll bring it right to your door and you'll hear me coming a block away because i'll be playing the ride of the valkyries really loud <laughs> i know you've always you, you used to have a, a white van that had kind of pseudo um uh and you know i don't pseudo i still have that well, now you have the real thing. You don't need yeah, to have any. You true. don't need to add the the fake lights on top. You've got them right here. It's true. It's true. But yeah, <laughs> uh, this is a, this is just another brand extension. <laughs> okay, Todd. So thanks cool. so much. We really appreciate Thank it. You, Todd. And, Thank and, you, Mark. And Thank so you, Kevin. Nice talking to you. You mentioned uh, teeny tiny fire truck. That's T E T E E N Y Y teeny. And then, is there anywhere else that people can kind of follow what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, my car geekdom is is pretty high right now. So my normal, my personal uh, Instagram account is Telstar Logistics, um, which is the fake company you were talking about a little while ago. So I'm most of my stuff is happening on Telstar Logistics, and that's 
mostly what I'm doing. I'm just a lot of visual storytelling these Great. days. It's been a lot of fun. That's so cool. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Todd. Thanks, gentlemen. Have a great day and stay safe. Hey, everybody. It's your co-host, Mark. And I wanted to let you know that we have a lot more going on here in Cool Tools than just this podcast. We have our flagship website where we review a new tool every day. That's at cool-tools.org. We also have four different newsletters. We have this podcast. We have a YouTube channel where we review tools. And if you like what you hear and see and read, the best way to help us out is by going to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash cool tools and donate at any level you wish. You can even contribute $1 a month, and, and that would mean a lot to us. The money that you give us will go towards paying for our transcribing costs, editing videos, and editing the podcast. It goes towards paying contributors who write the reviews for us. It goes towards our equipment costs, our hosting costs, and it supports our very small company of three people. This week, I wanted to give a shout out to some of our Patreon supporters who have been giving us at least $2 a month. And if you give us $2 a month, we'll give you a shout out online. And this week, I would like to thank Michael Sakochia, Molly Starr, M. Velderman, Opposable Thumbs, Pamela Cooley, Patrick Weyer, Paul Hosey, Randy Fisher, Stuart Burroughs Brand, Synaptic Sam, Therese Schwartz, Tom Hawkins, Tom Markham, What Bear, Javier Pangolin, David Lang, Eric Byers, Sean Hartley, Stephen Powell, Greg Lichtscheidt, John Hobson, Adam Bristol, Adam Naher, Anonymous, Bill Kempthorne, Bruce I. Niles, Chris Woodruff, C. Colos, Daryl Flynn, Egg Fliegoff, Eric Hanschrau, Eric Hoover, Godfrey Saldana, Jay Skiles, John M. Larson, Jude Galligan, Kenneth Gilman, and Lucas Frank. Thank you very much for supporting the show, and we will see you next week.